Good morning to all who have joined us for our worship today. We are thankful to our Father for this opportunity to uh, assemble in this way while we're under the difficult circumstances that we find ourselves and to uh, worship the Lord our God and acknowledge him for who he is and to, to do our very best to glorify his name and all that that we do, and certainly in remembrance of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, who sacrificed so much for us that we might live for him. We're going to begin, Brother Matthew, with his song, followed by the reading of scripture by Brother William. Matthew. All right, our first song will be Face to Face. <coughs> No soul face to face with Christ my Savior, face to face, what will it be when with rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ, who died for me? Scripture reading from this morning will be from the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verse 12. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. And if you please turn to Philippians, chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown in this way, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. All 
All right, we'll sing 479, I Know That My Redeemer Lives. I know that my Redeemer lives and ever prays for me. I know eternal life he gives from sin and sorrow free. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. No, I know eternal life he gives. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that unto sinful men in saving grace is nigh. I know that he will come again, take me home on high. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he gives. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that over yonder stands a black river for me. A home, a house I made with it. It's wonderful to see. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he gives. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. <coughs> Our next song will be Teach Me, Lord, to Wait, and then we'll have our first prayer. No. <clears throat> oh, soul, teach me, Lord, to wait right down on my knees, in your my pleas. Teach me not to rely on what others do, but to wait in prayer for an answer from you. Teach me, Lord, to wait while hearts are Humble my pride and call on your name. Be my faith renew. My eyes on you. Let me be on this earth. What you want me to be. Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be. Teach me, Lord, teach me, Lord, to
Let's pray. Father, we come before you thankful for the ability to meet together in this time. And as the song we just sang, teach us to wait. I pray that we are joyful and, and anxious in our wait for your return or for our, our return to home with you. Father, we thank you for all that you have done in our lives. We ask that you be with us as we come to worship you, as we focus our thoughts, thoughts towards your word, as we examine our life, as we think about others around us that need encouraging and spurred on. We ask that you touch all those that are in our congregation and, and around the world that are struggling. We pray that you are made known and made relevant in so many people's lives. Father, we thank you for what you have been able to do through all the things of the last three or four months where, where we've been pressed and, and uh, restricted and our lives have changed. We thank you that you are still God and that you have not changed, that your grace is still sufficient and that your love has no end. Father, we thank you for all that you have done and all that you are going to do. We know whom is able to keep that which we've committed unto you against that day, and we have faith and hope in that. We pray that you uh, bless Brother Bill as he speaks, that you encourage the words, that you inspire the words that encourage us. In your son's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Our next song will be, I believe, in Mount Calvary. <clears throat> the soul. There are things as we travel this earth shifting sands. That transcend all our reason of man. But the things that matter the most in this world, they can never be held in our hands. I believe in a hill I believe whatever the cost, and when time has surrendered, and earth is no more, I'll still cling to that old rugged cross. I believe that the Christ who was slain on that cross has the power to change lives today. For he changed me completely, a new life is mine. That is why <clears throat> cross I will stay. I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. I believe whatever the cost. <clears throat> Life with its great mysteries, surely someday will do it. But faith will conquer the darkness and death, and will lead. 
friends. I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. I believe whatever the cost, and when time has surrendered and earth is no more, I'll still cling to that old rugged cross. Ron. Before we eat the designated emblems that have been prepared this morning, the bread representing his body given for us, and then the cup that represents his blood that was poured out for our sanctification and cleansing, I'd like to look at a prayer that the Apostle Paul offered up for the Ephesian Christians in chapter three of Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus while he himself was a prisoner in Rome. If you'd like to read along, I'm gonna read Ephesians chapter three, beginning in verse 14. Ephesians three, beginning in verse 14. I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, verse 18, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge and that you be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now, Paul prayed that the Christians in Ephesus might be strengthened with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ would dwell in their hearts through faith and that they be rooted and grounded in love so that they would come to a fuller and deeper understanding of that amazing love of Christ that was beyond just academic knowledge and be filled up with the fullness of God. Beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, may I propose that we offer up a similar prayer for one another and all the saints, Christians, throughout the world today, as in that we be strengthened with power through the Holy Spirit, that the Lord Jesus Christ would dwell in our hearts through faith, that we be rooted and grounded in love, a love for each other and for God, and that we might come to a deeper understanding and appreciation for what our Savior did for us. When he who knew no sin became as sin on that cruel cross of Calvary, as he took your sins, my sins, and the sins of the whole world to himself, so that he might become the righteousness of God and give us the hope of living eternally with him in heaven. Would you bow with me as we offer thanks for the bread? Almighty God, 
our Lord, our Creator and King. We humbly and reverently offer you our thanks for this bread that represents your Son, our Savior's slain body on Calvary so that we can be sanctified, redeemed, made holy before you, our great God and King. We pray, Father, that as we partake of this bread this morning, that we will do so in a manner pleasing before you as we remember what your son went through, what he suffered for us and for the whole world. We pray that we would be strengthened with power through your spirit, that Christ would dwell in our hearts through faith now, throughout this week, and, and forever as we journey through this life. That we might truly come to a deeper and fuller understanding and appreciation for what you did in allowing your son to leave heaven, come to this earth, suffer here on this earth, go to the cross, and die for us. Bless us as we engage in this time of communing with thee, our Savior, through the partaking of this bread. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Please bow with me again as we offer thanks for the cup, the fruit of the vine, representing our Savior's blood. Holy Father in heaven, we're so grateful for this memorial feast. It's time we, we can remember and commemorate your son, your love for us, his love for us and going to the cross for us. Thank you for this fruit of the vine, this cup that represents his precious blood that was poured out on that cross from his head, from his hands, his feet, his, his back, his side, so that we can have forgiveness of sin and the hope of life eternal and this short life on earth is over. Help us to drink this cup in a way fully commemorating your Holy Son, our Savior. In his blessed name we pray, amen. As we conclude the Lord's Supper this morning, I'd like to continue reading in Ephesians chapter 3, in verse 20. Paul speaking to the Ephesians, and I believe to us this morning, being filled up with the fullness of God, 
Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all we ask or think according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. As we are filled up with that fullness of God through his word, through his spirit, God can work in us. powerfully to be the people, the Christians, his children adopted into his family for his glory and honor and work beyond what we can even imagine or think as we surrender our lives to his will for his glory. Brother Matthew. Come before Brother Bill's lesson will be I love my Savior too. Jesus, my heavenly King, loves me, I know. Praises to him I sing, onward I go. Closely to him I cling, blessings to flow. I love my Savior too. I love my Savior. He loves me too. I seek his favor in everything. Walking with him each day, love light doth shine. Doing his will always, never repine. Kneeling to him I say, thy will not mine. I love my Savior too. I love my Savior. He I seek his favor in everything I do. Happy to serve my friend, lean on his arm. Rapture will never end, nothing alarm. Voices will sweetly blend under his charm. I love my Savior too. I love my Savior. He loves me too. I seek his favor in everything I do. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you. I'm glad to have the opportunity again to preach the Word of God. I think about the Bible in terms of how these stories that we read in the Bible were, you know, just imagining the first century readers as they heard these stories, because many of them did not experience the things that the apostles did or that the writers of the New Testament experience, and so they're hearing them, and we're hearing them just like they do. I just wonder, though, if we can capture the imagination, the, the, the thrill of, of the imagination that they must have had when they, they heard these stories. Uh, I, I worry, and this is the point of my lesson, that, that I worry that we just, sometimes when we read the Bible, that we're just reading it as words off of a page, and we're failing to realize 
that these are the very words of God. And so one of the stories that have always been impressive to me is the story of the transfiguration of Jesus. I, I think about Jesus taking them up there to the high mountain to pray. And uh, as Luke tells us, the rest, Luke is the only one that tells us that Jesus took him up on the mountain to pray. And uh, Peter, James, and John are there. And, uh, you know, one of the things that you get from Luke as well is that they were sort of exhausted. And, I mean, rightfully so. I mean, they're, they're, they're going up on the high mountain. I, I don't know what mountain they went on. We're not told. Uh, but they're, we know the general region where they are. And so likely it seems that it could have been uh, Mount Hermon. We don't know. We just don't know. And, uh, but anyway, I mean, they've, they've climbed this high mountain. I mean, Mount Hermon was the highest peak in Jerusalem. And there they have, I, I, you know, maybe altitude, you know, they were just tired from, from making that journey uphill. And so we find that uh, Luke tells us that they, you know, they were, went to sleep. Luke likes to remind us that the apostles or the disciples of Jesus went to sleep at very critical times. I mean, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, we find them sleeping as well, but so the disciples are reading this. I mean, they're hearing this for the first time. Remember, this stuff is not written in real time. It's written for readers later. And as Matthew has pointed out in some of the epistles when they were written and so forth, so were some of the gospels written about the same time and so on and so forth. And so they're not being written as, as the events are occurring. And in fact, this one particular event about the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus tells his disciples, don't tell anybody, the three, he tells the three, Peter, James, and John, don't say anything to anybody about this until after I am risen from the dead. And so there are things about it that, you know, people would have read it just the same as you and I did. They, Peter didn't, and James and John didn't go around telling everybody, hey, we just went up the mountain with the Lord and he was praying and all of a sudden he was transfigured and we saw Elijah. They didn't do that. So, my point is that people read it just as you and I are reading this. They're hearing it from Mark. They're hearing it from Matthew. They're hearing it from Luke. And they're reading this. And so when you look at these particular accounts and you think about what is taking place here, I mean, here's a map and there is, uh, generally when you look at this map and this is not, I've got to move my, you see where Mount Hermon is, just, just to the left, which is on the right of your screen toward the top, just down below Mount Hermon, just to the left, you see Bethsaida down there, straight north, about 30 miles, the Caesarea Philippi. Now that's the last location we have of them before they go up to the Mount of Transfiguration, whichever mount that might have been. We don't really know, as I said, but Caesarea Philippi is some hundred miles from Jerusalem, so it's at the very northern end of Israel's territory in the, in, in the tribe, tribal land of Dan. And so here they have, and you remember Caesarea is the place where Jesus asked his disciples, whom do men say that I am? Caesarea was such a beautiful place that it was the home in a lot of cases to many foreign leaders and, and they would make their vacation homes there and so on and so forth. And as a result, they would make altars or tents or uh, things to their particular gods. So it's an appropriate place for Jesus to ask as he's got that in the background, all these different places where people lived and they built their altars to their gods that had come from foreign lands. And, and, you know, this was their vacation home and they would put, their God there. And so it's a perfect place for Jesus to say to his disciples, whom do, men, whom do men say that I am? And so on and so forth. And then whom do you say that I am? And then he tells them that, you know, I've got to, uh, for the first time, I've got to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be suffering many things and be scourged and crucified. And that's about all they heard. They didn't hear the last part, or if they heard it, they didn't get it. I, and it, I'm sure they heard it. They didn't understand it when he said, I, but I will, be, I will be raised from the dead. 
you know, there's just a lot of, I mean, there was a general idea of the resurrection. I mean, the Pharisees had a general idea. They believed in the general resurrection of the dead, but what all of it entailed, uh, not even the apostles really knew. And, uh, you know, they, they had seen Jesus raise people from the dead. Is that what resurrection was going to be? Is that, is that just a raising back from the dead in this physical body or, or what? They, they had no really idea of what all that meant. I think that's one reason that Jesus charges them not to speak to anybody about what they saw, because we'll talk about that in a minute too, because Jesus is going to talk to in the Mount of Transfiguration. He's talking about his death and, and his exodus, as Luke would say in Luke, the ninth chapter. So, you know, this story as it's, as it's unfolding in, in the minds and hearts of those who are listening uh, that Matthew's writing to, that Mark's writing to, to Theophilus, to whom Luke is writing to. Uh, you, you just imagine, you know, as it captured their imagination. They, they knew these places. They were fully aware of, of where these places were. And so what we have then in this text uh, are just a number of things that I think are important for us to help understand what the transfiguration is all about how it helps us, and how it helps us see things that are really critical to, to our view of God, to our view of the world, to our view of death. And so the context and narrative, I, I just want to look at for a moment because that, that's a really important. So if we think about this for just a moment, uh, in the context of what happens, and, and I say the reason I, I think there's, it's important to note the context, is that Mark tells us in Mark the ninth chapter, as Matthew does, uh, and Luke does. Now Luke says eight days, but but and there's a reason for that. But but anyway, the point is that after six days, uh, anyway, they're linking what has happened, what has just happened, by that phrase after six days. So it's it's telling us something that you know there's a connection here. This this all happened after this. So there's a reason that this chronology is there for a reason. I think if we, we go back to Acts 8, and, or Acts 8, Mark 8, and start there, and I'm just going to use Mark's account because it's briefer, and he makes a point in here that, I, that the others don't make. That's always a good thing to, to read where you have more than one account, to, to look at them, read them carefully, and try to pick out the differences uh, that you see. They're, they're not different in the sense that they're contradicting, but they're giving you more information about it than you would have had otherwise. So if we go back to Mark, the eighth chapter, and we look at verse 27 and go through chapter 9 and verse 1, and Jesus went on with his disciples to the village of Caesarea, Philippi, and on the way he asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets, and he asked it, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. They weren't prepared. I'll just say this at this juncture. They just were not prepared to defend Jesus as the Messiah. And that's the reason he tells them, don't go around saying that I'm the Christ because I don't, you know, you've got more things you need to learn. They're not quite in a position. The reason I know that is because of what happens next. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. So that's how I know that they weren't ready to prepare, they weren't prepared, weren't ready to defend him as the Messiah. Peter didn't, Peter didn't understand why he had to suffer. Peter, I, you know, I don't know if Peter thinks he's going to be the Messiah in spite of the sufferings at some point, but the truth of the matter is Jesus said, I can't be the Messiah unless I do suffer, and that's something Peter couldn't grasp. And so he said this plainly. Peter took him aside and, and began to rebuke him, but turning and seeing his disciples, he, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? 
For what can a man give in return for a soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father and with the holy angels? And he said unto them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Notice, you know, in this, in Mark's rendition of this, he talks about those who are ashamed of his words. Obviously, he's talking to Peter. He's, he's, he's saying, Peter, you can't be ashamed that I'm going to go into, as I've said, this has to be done. Notice how Jesus says that in Mark, the eighth chapter. When he, when he tells me, he said, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer, you see. And so this, Jesus was not going to be the Messiah in spite of the suffering. He's going, he is the Messiah because of the suffering. That's the point. Of course, this is a point that a lot of people miss when it comes to the kingdom. They're, you know, they're still waiting for the kingdom to come. Some people are. They think that when the uh, end time comes, the kingdom is going to be set up and we're all going to Israel. No, that's not even the point. They're missing the point. And that is that, uh, you know, and they say that has to happen. The reason that the kingdom wasn't set up during Jesus' lifetime is because they rejected Jesus. And so they reject, they, Jesus just left us the church. Well, the truth of the matter is Jesus said, I must go through this as a matter of God's predetermined plan. It wasn't some accident. It wasn't because they rejected him. God knew full well they were going to reject Jesus. And so the kingdom wasn't postponed until the end of time. It was all part and parcel of it. Even as this text points out, truly I say to you, there are some of you standing here who will not taste or experience death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. And so that, that has to refer to Acts, the first chapter, when they asked Jesus, will thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times or seasons that are in the Father's hand, but you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And that occurred on the first Pentecost after the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead in Acts 2, that that power of the Spirit came upon them, as Peter talked about in Acts 2, beginning in verse 17, and then pointed out that Jesus had to suffer the things that he did by the predeterminate forecount of foreknowledge of God. And so here in this context, you have this confession of, of Peter that thou art the Christ, then you have the confirmation of that Jesus said, then the Christ must suffer these things. And then he talks about the coming of the kingdom. And after, he says, you know, uh, in verse 2, and after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John. So after he had told them that the kingdom was coming with power, he takes them up into this high mountain. As Mark says, he, took, he led them up a high mountain by themselves. Now, it's Luke that tells us that he, he led him up to this mountain to pray. And while he was praying, Luke tells us that he was transfigured, that his face became this dazzling whiteness and so forth. I love the way that Mark says it. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version. And his, disciple, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach. It's whiter than anything that they had ever seen. It's more dazzling. It is so white. It is brilliant. It is so, so uh, powerfully. His, his outward figure had changed to this radiance that was just so dazzling, as, as Matthew would say. Brighter than the sun, I think, is what uh, Luke says. Can you imagine something brighter than the sun at, at, at noonday? I mean, that, that you, I mean, it is distinguishable enough that you can tell that it's brighter than the sun. You can say something's bright, but it's lost in the brightness of the sun. But here's something that's brighter than the sun. I think there's a reason for all of that as well. But it's, as, as Mark would say, uh, no one on earth could bleach it this white. And, uh, you know, it's interesting that the idea of how they would get things white and so forth. It's an interesting term in terms of the book of Revelation. We talked about being washed and having your robes made white and so forth. And, and it would be whiter than white. And the idea is that 
God, our glory in eternity, is going to reflect that of Jesus, of what they're seeing. But the other thing is, in the narrative now, when we go to, to look at the narrative, as I said, he was transfigured in the midst of praying. We can talk about that in just a moment and, and how we view things. But I, you know, what it reminds me of, and if you think about it, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get ahead of myself if I say that. So here's where I can talk about it. And I want you to notice all of the Old Testament connections that are here. There's Elijah, there's Moses, and there's the mountain, and there's the cloud, and there is this transfiguration that, that occurs. And so when you read about the transfiguration, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, and led them up a high mountain. I'm reading Mark 9, verse 2 by themselves, and he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. It's Luke 9, you see, that's helpful to us in this case, because what Luke tells us is they were talking about his exodus, or his decease. If you have a marginal note in your Bible, it'll have the word exodus there. They were talking about Jesus' death his exodus, his liberation. You see, if I just were to say to you, hey, let's do a word association, and if I say the word exodus, what would you think of? You would think of the children of Israel, wouldn't you? Being freed from Egyptian bondage, being, being liberated from slavery. And so here is the same idea that death was a liberation to Jesus. I tell you, Jesus saw death in a lot of different ways, foreign to a way that people of his day would have seen death. But here we think about Romans 8 as well, that we're going to be transformed into the liberty of the glorious creation of God, as, as Paul would say, paraphrasing in Romans 8, beginning in verse 18. And so here we have this connection in the Old Testament as well that I want to make. That What is significant about Elijah and Moses being there? I mean, I realize that Elijah is of the, uh, of the prophets, and Moses is the lawgiver, two of the greatest prophets that Israel ever had, Moses and Elijah. Moses was a prophet. Isn't it interesting that they went up into a high mountain? You remember Moses went up into a mountain, and he saw what? The glory of God passed him by, put him in the cleft of a rock, and, the, and God allowed the glory of God to pass by him in Exodus 34. Elijah, in, in when he was so discouraged and so depressed and thought he was the only one left, he went up into the mountain, the same mountain that Moses went up to. And what did God allow him to see? The glory of God passed by him. And so here now they are in the mountain with Jesus. And what happened? Jesus is transfigured. What, what does that mean? It means that they got to see Jesus in his glory. Isn't, I find it interesting that, that there is no surprise on the part of Elijah or Moses that they're standing there or that they're trying to figure out who Jesus is. I mean, I think in my mind, it is a clear evidence that Jesus was present in the Old Testament. They knew who he was when they saw him on, on this mount. They understood that, that he was God. So interesting, then you have the mountain, you have Elijah, you have Moses, you have the cloud. You remember, keep reading with me. Let me continue reading here. Uh, verse 5, and Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. You hear that? A voice came out of the cloud. Where else did that happen? It happened to Elijah, and it happened to Moses. You go to 1 Kings, the 19th chapter, and you go to Exodus 33 and Exodus 34, and, and uh, 34 in particular, God calls him up on the mountain and speaks to him. And so uh, that, that, that's the Old Testament connection. And so what, what's happening here, and you think about death, and they're talking about death. Well, didn't Moses die in some particularly specific circumstances? Well, of course. He wanted to go over into Jordan, and God said, no, you failed. Uh, you, I'm going to let you go up to Mount Pisgah, to Nebo, and I'm going to let you look over to the promised land, and you'll be able to see it, but you can't. Moses said, well, just let me step a foot in it, and 
And God said, no one quit asking. Uh, you, you didn't sanctify me in front of the people. And so this is your punishment. Now, I've always thought that was such a sad story because Moses had been so much like a father to Israel. And, and even as he would say, I've been, I, you know, he, he felt like he'd been their mother is what Moses said at one point. I didn't give these, I didn't, I didn't breastfeed these people. Uh, you know, I mean, he's so frustrated with them. And so he, he feels that way towards him and, and, and that sort of thing. And yet he doesn't get to cross over in the promised land. Had it not been for Moses, they never would have been able to go into the promised land. So, you know, people are reading this in, in, in Mark's day and Luke's day, and they're recalling this history. They, they, they know about it. And now they're seeing Moses and they're seeing Elijah with the Lord talking about Jesus' death and so on and so forth. And, of course, out of Moses' death, then we go to Elijah. Elijah never did die, did he? He, he was taken straight away. You know, remember Elisha and Elijah and that story and, so forth, and he was just taken up and was no more. And so here they come, and they see Jesus, and they have this conversation with him. And there's just all of these Old Testament connections that are being made. Remember what Jesus said, you shall see the kingdom of God. Some of you are standing here that will not taste of death to see the kingdom of God come with power. The kingdom of God is the rule of God that was going to come alive through Jesus Christ. And he was bringing that to pass. And so in, in partial fulfillment of that, I mean, even Moses and, and Elijah got to see the kingdom or the power, the rule of God, as Jesus is, uh, goes back into heaven and ascends, then what happens? The kingdom is established. And where, what is Jesus? Uh, he, he's in his glory. He's sitting down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so for a brief moment there, they get to see the glory of God. And, and so it begins to register a little bit with with the disciples that are there, but they still can't connect the dots and the dots can't be connected for them until the resurrection. But we see all of these various connections to the story. And then, as I said, the death and the departure, Luke nine verse 31 talks about his death and departure. Then here, and I don't mean to leave this as the last because this really is the point of, of the narrative. The voice of God speaks and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Or this is my beloved son, rather. Hear ye him. Or, and I like the English Standard Version much better, when it says, uh, and a cloud overshadowed them, a voice came out of the cloud, this is my beloved son, listen to him. And suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them, but Jesus only. I mean, I know that we normally talk about Elijah and, and Moses as a, one as a lawgiver, one as a reformer, and uh, so we're not under the old law. We don't listen to them. I think there's far more to it than just that. I, it seems to me that when we look at this whole story and you're unfolding it and you're listening to it as, as hearing it for the first time in light of the resurrection that's just happened and, and so forth, if you're sitting there in the first century, I think they're seeing all of God's promises beginning to be fulfilled. And, you know, it talks about uh, in 1 Peter, the first chapter, that the prophets sought diligently and inquired. Even the angels wanted to know when, when that spirit of glory was going to be revealed. Look, if you will, over in 1 Peter for just a moment in the first chapter, if you have your Bibles, and look there and see what it is that, Peter marvels at. This is uh, in 1 Peter, and then we're going to go to 2 Peter, the first chapter. This is 1 Peter, the first chapter. He said, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about that grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, in the things that they have now been announced to you through those who have preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels long to look to. So the prophets were looking for this. I, you know, I think that's in part uh, no surprise to uh, 
the Elijah and Moses. I mean, as I said, I think Jesus was fully participating and active in the Old Testament. Uh, and so that we have this view of him. And I think this is what happens to the disciples. So let me just talk to you quickly from 2 Peter 1. You say, okay, well, what, what, what is the point of all of this? And here it is. But 2 Peter, let, let Peter comment on this. Let, let him comment on this. Beginning at 2 Corinthians, he was an eyewitness. He says, 2, 2 Peter, rather, the first chapter beginning at verse, uh, I want to start at verse 12 here. He said, therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it right, as long as I'm in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon. What's he saying? I know that I'm dying as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my, listen to what he says, after my departure, you may be able to at any time to recall these things. After my decease. That's the same word that Luke used in Luke the ninth chapter, uh, that, that his departure. Now keep reading with me in verse 16. For we did not. The reason I believe this, he said, we, we didn't follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. The word majesty in the New Testament is only associated with the glory of God. For when he received honor and glory from the God the Father and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice, born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word. Matthew is so right when he said in Bible class this morning, prophets were those who told, the, who, who were the mouthpiece of God. They were telling forth the message that God wanted people to hear. There was an aspect of predictive element to their work, but that's not basically or fundamentally who they were. Fundamentally and basically, as he said, they were preachers. They were telling the message that God wanted people to hear. And so he said, we ourselves heard this very voice, and we have the prophetic word, the word that was preached, which was more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. And so he said, we have this word of prophecy that... From, from way back that was, uh, you know, unknown. But now we have in Jesus the light that's making it known. And he said, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. When the more you come to know Jesus, the brighter the light becomes. It becomes dazzling when you come to recognize that the very word that we're talking about, the very word that I'm preaching from, the very word that you sit and read in the morning, the very word that you talk about with, with other people, that is the very voice of God. That's the majesty from on high. That is God sitting across from you saying to you, Bill or George or Roger or uh, Matthew or Tom or whoever. He, he's saying, here's what I'm saying to you. And the more we get into that, the brighter the light shines and we say things more clearly. So he said, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. Th this word does not come by human construct. In other words, men didn't develop this. They didn't engineer this. They didn't des design this. They weren't the architects of it. Men can do a lot of wonderful things that just amaze us, but they can't do this. They can't, they can't give us this confidence. Only the voice of God can do this. Only the word of God, the word that came not by the will of men, but as he said, for no prophecy was, ever, no preaching is what he's saying. No inspired preaching was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, how be it when he, the spirit of truth has come, he shall guide you into all the truth. That's what he's telling his apostles. And now Peter is saying, that's exactly what happened. And Peter is, is basing all of this on the transfiguration, the significance of God's word, the importance of it, the majestic voice that's being heard through the word of God. Listen to him. 
Oh, do we not see the word of God? This book that we hold in our hands, this Bible. This is not just a leather bound edition. This is just not an expensive book because I've got a brand new Bible or got a really expensive. It's more precious than that. It's more valuable than that. This is God's voice. Listen to him. Listen to him. Don't, don't, don't resign him to the bookshelf to be a collector of dust. Hear his voice. And you know what will happen when you hear his voice? Peter tells us what happens when we hear his voice. Jesus is never viewed the same. You can have lots of wonderful thoughts about Jesus. You can hear people talk about Jesus. You can hear people say different things about Jesus. You, good things, positive things. Listen, you'll never have the view of Jesus that you ought to have until you come to his word and hear the majesty of his word, the power of his word, the very power that spoke the world into existence, the very power of his word that raised Jesus from the dead. The same power is available to us today through his word. Jesus is never viewed the same. Listen, the one thing Jesus cannot be, he cannot be just a good man. He's either Lord, lunatic, or liar, but he cannot be just a good man. He is the son of God, and that's why God spoke from heaven and said, this is my son. Listen to him. These aren't words on a page. These aren't syntactically correct. These aren't grammatically correct words. This is the voice of God speaking to you and me. Jesus is never viewed the same once we commit to his word and put our faith and our trust in his word. Secondly, death is never viewed the same. I mean, the Bible makes that clear, and that's because once you, once you come to see the biblical view of Jesus and who he is and truly come to understand that he is the Son of God, and that he's speaking to you and he's speaking to me. Can we not understand how important it is that we listen and hear his voice as he speaks and pleads with us? Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Find rest into your soul. And so that death is never viewed the same because Jesus faced death. He went to death. He was buried in a tomb and he was raised by the power of God. And so he, he frees us from the fear of death. Yeah, he frees us from that. Why? How does he do that? With his voice, with his words, with the assurance of the events that took place. As we sang a moment ago, because I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. Death is never viewed the same. It's an exodus. It's a departure. It's a liberation. And I think it's also to point out in the, sermon, in, in the Mount of Transfiguration that at death, these two, Elijah and Moses, Elijah who was no more and, G, and Moses who died, experienced Jesus in a whole new way than they could have ever experienced while on earth. That's what heaven is. It's experienced God in a whole new way in a far more grander and glorious and majestic way than we can even imagine. That's why Paul said, I have a desire to depart and to be with Christ, for it is far better to depart. I want to strike camp here. I want to break camp, and I want to go home to be with God. Death is never viewed the same once one comes to know who Jesus is. And let me tell you, once death is never viewed the same, the world is never viewed the same. I'm not exactly sure why Mark uses the analogy that he did in Mark the ninth chapter when he said, you know, no one on earth ever could get anything this white. Only God could do that. I wonder if he's pointing out the grandeur and power of God again that God can do what man cannot do. 
and that this world is not my home, I'm just passing through. Folks, we're made for a much better world. And we need to constantly trust in God and live for him. And we need to treat each other like God wants us to treat each other, to love each other and to be the kind of servants God wants us to be without regard to, to what the world does. Listen, the transfiguration is coming into this world in the first century with, the, with this account that we've just read. It's a world that, that, that says, my kingdom is not like this world. My kingdom is where those who live under my rule hear my voice, listen to it, and do what I say. Without question, without equivocation, and let me say this in closing. You know, one of these days very soon, we're going to quit this Zoom and meet together, physically, together once again. And that will be a great day. But you know what's even greater than that? As much as we long for that. And I wonder sometimes if that's not why we're going through this, to, to appreciate our assembling together. Of course, some will and some won't, because some will listen and some won't listen to God. But you know, as much as we want to be with each other and see each other, what do you think heaven is? Do you want to be there? That's the great reunion, to be with loved ones who have gone on before and to leave a legacy for our own children of what it means to view Jesus as the scriptures teach, to recognize that death cannot have the last word over us and that this world is not my home. The banner of the cross, what a glorious thought. We wanted to sing that song, and thank you for listening this morning. All right, we'll sing the banner of the cross before closing comments and prayer. There's a royal banner given for display to the soldiers of the king. As in in time there we lift it up today, while as ransom ones we sing. Marching on, marching on, for Christ counts everything for us. For the King of kings, tall and sing, neath the banner of the Over land and sea, wherever men may dwell, make the glory dies known. Of the crimson banner, now the story tell, while the Lord shall claim his own. Marching on, marching on, for Christ counts everything for us, for the King of kings, tall and ting, Neath the banner of the cross. When the great commander from the vault is gone, sounds a resurrection day. Then before our king the faint tempo shall die, and the saints shall march away. Marching on, marching on, for Christ counts everything but lost. For the King of kings, tall and sing, 
Need the banner of the cross. There we go. Okay. Thank you, Matthew, for those wonderful songs. Thank you, Bill, for a powerful lesson. One that we can all be encouraged by and, and give us hope and trust in the future and in the Lord, our Savior and the Father, our God. We're so thankful that we've had this opportunity to worship together today. Thank you for all those who've joined us. As we prepare to close, we, we want to keep in mind those of our spiritual family who are suffering and ill, as well as friends of, of ours and family members of some of ours. Uh, we want to remember the passing of David's brother, Eric, and that family in our prayers. Of course, Carol Ann has made us aware that our brother Bob is declining rapidly, and um, he's he's almost ready to be at home. And um, so we need to continue our prayers in that regard. And as she mentioned to us, um, they welcome visitation for the family, but seeing Bob now is probably um, mostly out of the question. Uh, I'll have more to say about that after we close. Um, our sister Helen is uh, making some progress in some areas, battling another infection, but uh, seems to have the proper uh, treatment for that. And so uh, after such a long illness, let's continue to pray fervently that uh, she might be blessed with recovery and, and a measure of renewed health. We, uh, we need to be uh, doing a lot of thinking about how we appreciate each other and uh, what we might be doing day by day to encourage one another uh, in our work uh, of living for Jesus and spreading his gospel, talking to others, thinking of ways that we might come out of this challenge this pandemic that we are living under and it's so restrictive of, of many things we'd like to be involved in and to do. So it, it ought to provide us a time of thought about how can I be more involved in the Lord's work and in living a, a much more dedicated life for him. And, and hopefully I do think we, we will meet again soon in the building. That is certainly my hope, and let's continue to pray for that. Uh, we're going to ask at this time Brother John Birch to lead us as we pray together. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we are so thankful to be your children, to have you to lean upon and to guide us in all that we do. We've spoken of the majesty of your son. Father, you are so above our imagination in your power and your majesty to create a universe so far beyond our ability to even think about. And to have us on this small earth to be your people and to have you to be mindful of us and for our needs. We are so thankful, Father, that you care for us. We're thankful for your love. And we pray, Father, that we might always realize when we read your word that you are speaking to us. Help us to see those words of wisdom and to know that you're there and to know your will for us. We're thankful, Father, that you are being with Bob. Through this time. <clears throat> Pray that you would continue to strengthen him for the time to come, that you are bringing him home in a way that is 
so much easier than, than many will die. We pray, Father, that you would strengthen him, that you would encourage him, that he might always know that his hand is in yours, and that you will be with his family. We pray, Father, for Helen. We're so thankful that she's recovered as much as she has. We pray you'll continue to strengthen her and to let her soon be with her family. We're thankful for your care for Graceland and for her recovery from the cancer treatment. We pray that will continue to be. And Father, we pray that you will be with David and Brenda through this time and with the family of Eric, his brother. Help them, Father, to be encouraged and strengthened, to encourage one another, to remember the blessings of the time when they were together, especially with Lynn, as she now has the loss of Eric. Help each of us, Father, to know that death is part of life and that we must always live preparing for that time when we can be together with you. We are thankful, Father, that we are able to meet in this way when so, so many things are restricted. We pray we might continue to be strengthened by our association and love together, that we might worship you, that we might encourage one another, Father. Help us to, to know the needs of any of our brethren and to take care of them. Help us, Father, to know that this is part of your plan and that in this time of emergency, many are turning to thoughts of eternity. Help us, Father, to use this time in a way that will be a blessing. Help us to learn ways to teach our fellow man and to find those opportunities, to make those opportunities to spread your gospel. Go with us, Father, through this day. Help us to be strengthened and encouraged by one another. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Uh, brothers and sisters,